Okay, I spoke out of turn. I know I said in the last part we were going to do geometry nodes. Got ahead of myself. Sorry to excite you. Uh, texturing and shading comes first because it is much more essential. Uh, in this case, for example, our donut. We've just got solid colors, and that's okay for our icing. But our donut base here is a solid, almost canary yellow. That's definitely the wrong shade of, of donut. Um, real donuts, bringing up some reference photos. By the way, this extra software here, I haven't mentioned it, uh, Pure Ref. It's what all 3D artists use to manage uh, reference. You can just like paste in images from the internet and then just create like a canvas and then like rearrange things. And it's really, really fantastic. Um, but anyways, I've just got two photos here. Um, real donuts, they're not just one solid color, right? As we spoke about in the last part, no, not last part, but the modeling part, right? Where we created that part that like indents it. Because of the way donuts are cooked, you have uh, some parts that are gonna receive less hot fat that it's sitting in when it's cooking. So this middle part, and it's most visible here, can often be lighter than the rest. Okay, that's one aspect of it. But then also the rest of the donut isn't one solid color either. It's also got, you know, light patches, brown patches, little speckly bits and things all over it. Um, and that can add interest. And you might not think you would see it. You know, if you were to do a render up here, you really wouldn't. But we're gonna have our donut spinning around on a turntable. So we do need to see it because we're gonna see the backside of it. So it's also, it's just a great opportunity to just learn about textures and shaders and things a little bit better. So we don't need our icing. So I'm gonna hide that just by hitting H or um, I think I mentioned this before, but you can also do it up here in the outliner, just clicking the little I there. We'll just hide it. Hotkey to bring anything back that has the material, uh, sorry, the little I disabled, it's Alt H. So hide with H um, or Alt H to bring it back. Anyways, okay. So this is our this is our donut here. Okay, now we spoke a little bit about the the materials over here. I mean, really, all we changed was just the base color, and we did some subsurface scattering for the uh, the 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 icing, and we also used the roughness down here. I would say, by the way, that like you know all these values here, they're like confusing, and a lot of artists can like get really into the weeds with it. Like if you just stick to the base color, the roughness value. Um, and then the normal map, which we'll get to in a bit for, for bump mapping, that's really like 90% of the materials you make will use just those three things, base color, roughness, and normal mapping. Um, but anyways, okay. Now this, this material view here that we've got here, you can see if you wanted to add in image textures and like combine things and whatever, it, this thing would get very bloated and very like annoying and frustrating to use. And actually the old, old version of Blender, like 2.4, 2.49, was like 10 years ago. Um, you had to do everything in this sort of, this this view here. Uh, thankfully, we don't have to do that any for, any, anymore. There is a node editor, which you can access by hitting the shader tab at the top of your window there. That'll take you to the shader workspace, which will load up all these extra windows and things. Um, I think mine is set to uh, solid view shading by default, but yours is probably this one. Um, but yeah, it's loaded up a bunch of extra windows here. I actually don't need the ones on the left-hand side. I never need them. So I'm actually going to click and drag across to merge them. So top left-hand corner of any like sub window and then you click and drag across uh, and then you can merge or you can just right click on the area and say join areas and then just merge it across. So all I'm looking for is my model at the top here and then at the bottom here, this is our node editor. So you can see that this node here, this whatever, this long list of settings, let's call it, this resembles what is over here. Because in fact, it is a one-to-one -one copy. So this material panel here is really just a way to like, if you need simple changes, like, you know, you're just adding in an object, you know, and then, you know, I, you know, I just want that object to be, you know, red or something. I can do it over here very quickly. But if I want to do texturing and combine things and do like interesting things with the material, that's when you want to switch to the shader. Um, sorry, the, the, the node editor, which is where you can do, um, you can add extra nodes and extra things and it gets really interesting um, and you can do it all here. So the way that the node editor works, if you've never worked with nodes, is it works from left to right, okay? And it's very simple at the moment because this, this thing, by the way, these boxes, these are called, whoops, nodes. 
okay? And they work left to right. So uh, it's taking a single shader, this principal BSDF, which I, as I said, is based off of uh, Disney shader. It's fantastic. It's got everything you need most of the time. And then it's just outputting it into this, sorry, it's sending that data into the material output as the surface value. And that is what is being rendered. So if I was to add in another node and plug it in here, uh, it would change how it looks. So as an example, if I went to add, and then I added in texture, let's just pick a texture, let's go Veroni texture. Um, I've got another node here with some things, distance, color, position, and all things here. If I was to take this, plug this into my uh, base color, um, you can see that now this is reflecting. So it's it's lost the setting that was there before, that canary yellow. It's lost that and it's replaced it with the input of my Veroni texture. Um, you should see the difference between distance and color. Texturing, it, it's it's a whole thing in and of itself. There's courses on procedural texturing. Um, it's, it's very interesting and you can do a lot with it. Um, the great thing about a workflow like this, like using a node to create textures, um, is that you you can come back and change it later on. Like if I was to paint in the uh, this browning, white, yellowing effect or whatever, this little speckly view there, that is one way that you could texture a donut. You could do it that way. The problem is, is if I then later on realize like, ah, you know, the size of those speckly bits, you know, they're too big or they're too brown or something like that. If I'd painted that in, I couldn't change it easily later on. But I could if I had done it with shaders over here with, with procedural non-destructive workflows like this, I could come back and change it at any time. So anyways, you can see that going left into this to right and then spitting it out into the material output. That is how we are creating a shader. Okay, so let's delete that and let's now create the actual texture, okay. So I'm going to add in, add or shift A, same hotkey as the 3D viewport by the way. I'm gonna add in the, the texture that you use like 10 times more than any of these others, to be honest, besides maybe image texture, um, is noise texture right here. So this noise texture, you can see that you've got two outputs, you've got color and you've got factor, and they are very similar. The factor value is basically just the grayscale gray scale version of the color. So the color is giving us a sort of a rainbow splatter across everything. And if I change the scale here, I can change the size of that, uh, that splattering effect. If I take the factor, put that into the base color, it's just the black and white version of that. Okay, so that's all very well and cool, but how do I create the colors of my original donut light? Like the, the colors that I had here originally. By the way, if you want to cut a node string, which you've got there, you could just click and like remove it like that. Um, or if you just wanna cut and slice through the middle, it's control right mouse drag, and that'll bring out the knife and then it will just sever any color, any connection basically. So if I wanna change the colors of that, I could do this by adding in another node between these two. Um, and the node that I'm looking for is add, or shift A, add, converter color ramp. Color ramp is a really handy node, you'll use it a lot. Um, and if I drop that in between here, this is now taking the black and white values and is converting it into this uh, range essentially. And you can see that if I just change these sliders, it's basically acting like a contrast of that, that noise texture, but I could change the colors here to be, you know, anything I wanted. I could make a really weird, horrible looking donut very quickly. But if I change these to something a little more similar to the original donut color, something like that maybe, um, and then maybe make this like a little bit darker, uh, a little bit more saturated, Let's bring that across or something like that. That looks a little closer to something that was right here. Um, something else that'll really help you, um, and I'm, I wanna use it straight away, is actually, ch um, it's the Node Wrangler add-on. Because what I wanna do is I wanna preview my noise texture here to show you something, but you can't really see it very well. And the, yeah, basically go to your edit uh, preferences and then go to add-ons and then just type in node, and you should see one here called Node Wrangler. So just enable that, and then this will enable you to, if you hold down Control, Shift, and left click on any node, you are then previewing just that node. So just seeing the raw output of that and bypassing all this other stuff. Um, I could also Control, Shift on the color ramp, and I could see just that. And then if I wanna see everything, I just Control, Shift, click on the final shader there. The Node Wrangler is like the one add-on that all Blender users use 
all the time because it's so handy. You can do a bunch of stuff with it, um, but yeah, it's this is one really convenient feature. Anyways, what I wanted to show you with this noise texture here is that it's actually, there's a bit of noise, sorry, there's a bit of stretching. The size of these splotches here are different to how they look on the top. On the top, they look fine, but on the sides here, they look stretched. And that is a little bit technical, but the way that any texturing works in 3D software is it has to take a 2D texture. Think of like a Photoshop file, it's, a, it's an image. And then it has to somehow map that onto a 3D model. Um, in fact, this is actually very obvious when you add an image texture. So if I just add in an image texture, just to demonstrate this, um, yeah, let's use, why not? Let's use a thumbnail from the previous, uh, previous parts of this tutorial series. If I just paste this on here, bam, nightmare fuel. Um, let's turn off, uh, let's go for a look, there you go. Um, you can see that it is, it's, it's stretched around the donut. It's tried to add it. Yeah, it's basically, it's mapped parts of that 2D texture onto this 3D model. It has to do it somehow. And it just so happens that the one that it does for procedural textures, which is what this is, this, uh, this noise texture, it's just wrong. Um, the, it, I think it uses UV or generated or something. Instead, we want to change it to something else. So we can do that by adding another image, uh, another node over here to the left. So shift A, and then the one that you are looking for is input texture coordinate, texture coordinate. So the default one is generated. So if you don't have anything connected into your vector input, which is, by the way, the vector input, vectors, how do you explain vectors? You don't. <laughs> you just don't. In the beginning tutorial series, you don't need to know it. But really, it, the, the, the colors of these inputs, yellow goes to yellow, green goes to green, gray goes to gray. I mean, it doesn't actually, gray and yellow can be interchangeable. It doesn't really matter uh, if gray goes into a yellow, but generally you want to use the same color going to the same color. So this blue one, you must make sure that at least you've always got a blue input going into it, but should be a t texture coordinate is the one you're looking for. So generated is the one that it will use by default if nothing is uh, added into it. What we want to change it to is object. When you do that, you might think like, oh, it's broken, nothing's happened. It is there, it's just that the scale of this has changed. So I need to increase this to be much higher before I can see that back. And now you can see I don't have that stretching occurring across the, uh, the donor. Basically object, it will basically treat the 3D view rather instead of like wrapping it around, it'll sort of like, try to understand it like in a 3D, a 3D depth, the depth of it. And like, if this part of the mesh is like hitting this part of the cloud, it'll map it to there. And anyway, that's sort of the way I imagine it. It's, uh, it's just, yeah, it does the correct mapping essentially <laughs> for our donut. So uh, we'll change the scale of this. Okay, this is the joy of procedural workflows like this. You can change the size and shape and things of anything you want. You can also change the detail. Um, which you can't really see much going on here, but if you go like detail zero, it's just like soft, uh, soft big shapes, but then you can increase it. And it's kind of like it's adding more and more smaller shape splotches in between it almost. Um, but default is two, let's just leave it at that. All right. The other thing I want to do in this case is I want to create, um, and this is the joy of nodes, is that uh, you can take the output of this and not just use it for the color input, which we've got here, but actually make it drive another part of the shader. And uh, one part of the shader we wanna make it drive is the bump map, okay? Because looking at our reference here, you can see you can see it especially on the silhouette, but you can see it here, like the, the surface, if you were to run your, your fingernail across that donut, you would see it, it, like it would raise, there's little bumps and, and micro grooves and everything happening across there. Um, so we want to make that, this splotchy effect, not just affect the color, but also affect the bump. And we can do that by adding another note because uh, what, we want, what we need to do is make it drive this normal input. And there is no way you could ever guess that normal is what would drive the bump information of a shader. And while it would be great to make it like user-friendly and say, just call this bump, it's not just used for bump. It's used for a whole bunch of things. It's basic, normal is the, the directions of the face on the, the, uh, the model, essentially. So if you're doing something to the normals, the normals of a shader, you are changing the appearance of the way those faces look. It's, it's, like, it's all very technical. It's kind of mathematical. You don't really need to know it. <laughs> Other than to say that this is a blue input, a blue 
yeah, input. So you couldn't take, and you could try, you, if you put the gray, the factor output of that noise texture into there, that would be wrong, 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 okay? It doesn't know what to do. It's now like it's converted our faces from smooth to just hard. It's, it's completely wrecked it. I would actually love it if it just came up as red. Like, don't do that. This thing should just be red. We need to convert this first into information that the normal, uh, the normal thing can read. So to do that, we want to hit Shift A, and then go vector, and the node I'm looking for is bump, okay? If I dropped this in here, if I drop it over a highlighted uh, connector, it will now uh, automatically drop it in there in the middle and connect it. It's done it terribly though. <laughs> it's tried to guess, but it's, 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 done, it's done a bad job. I don't wanna drive the normal input, I wanna put it into the height input, height. Okay, now it is appearing uh, the way it should. It's just way, way, way too strong. Now you might think that the that what you need to change is the strength. It's actually not correct. Um, the, the the strength should always be one. It's kind of like on or off, like bump. The, the one that you're looking for is distance, which is how in the 3D space, like how big do you want these bumps to appear? So it doesn't have a like a nice slider or anything, but it's it's the one you need. And I believe I could be totally wrong on this, but I have heard. I'm pretty sure it's correct, but this distance value is in Blender units, which is by default metric. So this is treating this bump as if it is one meter. Like you want the bumps to be one meter, uh, which is ridiculous. So it's about a hundred times what it should be. So I'm gonna change this to 0 0.002, 0 0.002. And now that is much, much better. Now you can't really see, can you see it? You can see it okay. Um, you would see it a lot better, actually, if you turned up the detail. Now, this is the joy of uh, bump mapping, <laughs> of, of normal mapping, really, because that's what this is. Um, this is fakery. All this detail here is detail that you get for free. Um, you can see it's not changing the silhouette of our donut, okay, which is important. This is just, it's a fakery illusion to pretend as if this, this detail exists when it doesn't. So it's only appearing on the shader. So on the faces of the light and everything like that, it's not actually displacing it. If you wanted to do that, you would have to pay for it with so much higher like mesh density and everything. We did it actually for the previous tutorial. We'll not be using it for this because it was overkill. I went way too far on that. Um, we're just gonna keep it simple and it make it look nicer as well. So I often joke like the person who discovered normal mapping Oh, this this technique for bump mapping must have fallen out of their chair, like in 1990s or 80s or whatever. There must have been like, this is the key that will finally enable us to create the detail needed in film and everything without having to pay for it on our, you know, ridiculously slow computers. Because it's it's really insane what it's doing for free. It's video, all video games use normal maps because it's just, it's fake detail and you don't have to pay for it with, with render times. So it is phenomenal. Anyways, um, so I don't want to use a detail of three because look, this is where it comes into like how detailed, how realistic do you want your donut to look? Um, because if you go really detailed, you kind of have to do it for everything or else this one part will look odd. Um, I see it a lot because I got two kids now, one, two, one, four. One, one that is two years old, one that is four. That was a weird sentence. Um, and they just watch terrible kids shows because there's just so much terrible kids content out there. Um, it's just like all kids shows, they just don't care about like detail consistency. They'll have like a high res grass model and then just like this simplified house. And it's like, why? why you, like, can you not tell that that like super detailed mega scans grass model doesn't go with that like Duplo house? I don't know. It's just one of my pet, <laughs> pet peeves. But what I'm saying is, is like, if you go really detailed on this, you will have to do it for your icing, your everything. So we actually want to go simplified. Keep it sort of a stylized sort of look. I reckon I like something around about three. That might look good. And then, uh, you know, change the size of your scale or whatnot if you want to change that. But something like that. Like it's, it's still clearly like not very, like the color hasn't changed much. Um, and we're gonna in the next part actually do do some texture painting, but you can see that it, it's just it's got more visual interest there than was before. I might actually turn that down to like an even subtler amount, maybe somewhere in the middle. You can change it at any point in the process. That is the joy of of three D rendering. Um, okay, cool. So 
in the next part, we are gonna be doing the painting aspect where we're going to create that white part that goes around the middle there. Um, and then we're gonna be combining it with the rest of our shader here um, and learning some more good stuff. So click here to join me in the next part. See you there.